Okay, now for the bit which some of you have been waiting for, the radios. You'll see we've got three radios here in the front. So the first radio we've got here is an ICOM 7100. So this is an amateur radio which does HF, 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. It's been described as a shack in a box because it's basically your HF radio, your UHF radio, and your VHF radio all in one device. This radio is remote headed, so it goes on a cable down to the back. This isn't the actual radio itself, this is just a control unit. The second radio we have here, this one is a Kodan 9323. It's rather old. It's actually built by an Australian company, Kodan, based out of Adelaide. This one is not an amateur radio and it's type approved. What does that mean? You're allowed to use this one on commercial HF networks. Yes, we have commercial HF in Australia still. There are commercial HF four-wheel driving networks with several frequencies and base stations and scheduled contacts and all that sort of thing as well as telephone patches so you can pay your monthly fee there and actually have a base station operator to talk to so you can um, in your scheduled contact talk to the base station operator tell them where you are and then your family can ring the base station operator and ask when they last heard from you this means you don't have to get an amateur radio license in order to be able to use HF. It's a commercial network where everything's tied up in one nice, neat, type-approved package. So you'll notice it doesn't have a microphone plugged in. That's because currently at the moment it's configured to be the transmitter for our APRS setup. Every five or six minutes or so, it transmits our GPS position over HF radio and there's a network of receiver stations located basically one or two in every state of Australia, one of which usually picks us up during daylight hours and forwards it on to the APRS network, which is a giant packet radio mesh that spans all around the world, out into space and back, is accessible from the internet. You can go online and see where we are with this end not depending on mobile signal at all. Like anywhere in Australia, roughly during daylight hours, that signal is going to get into one of the base stations. Now that's an amateur solution. The commercial HF networks have their own solution with a little less coverage and a little less update rate, but that's how you do it with amateur radio. Our third radio here, the unit in UH5060. So this is just a relatively cheap and simple UHF CB. Well, yeah, it's UHF CB. This is useful to have in addition to the amateur radios. It's CB, do I really have to explain it? No, you don't. No, no. The head unit for this one is actually inside the dashboard, unlike the other two radios which are at the back. And it uses an RJ45 connection to the microphone which has all of the controls on it. There's a pass through here in one of the switch blank slots which Lightforce manufactures, which then lets you just run a cable from the radio head to the back of this, and then you can plug the microphone just straight into the dashboard, and there's not another box floating around here. So as you may well see, this car looks like a bit of a rolling cactus. So the first antenna we have on the passenger side bull bar is a Diamond NR770 HSP. It works on two meters and 70 centimeter band, and that's connected to the ICOM 7100's UHF VHF out port. The second antenna we have here is a Diamond HF30CL. This one is actually connected to the Kodan 9323. It supports 30 meters HF and only 30 meters HF. You cannot change bands without swapping this entire antenna out. It is center loaded, which makes it more efficient than a bottom loaded antenna. Supports around about 80 watts of power. 30 meters is 10.100 to 10.150 megahertz. You can adjust the tuning by sliding that top section up and down, but we've just cut off the top section. So when you stick it all the way in, it's correct because the bandwidth on this antenna basically covers the entire band because the entire band is so small. Third antenna we got at the front, it's an RFI Mopole antenna. The good thing about this antenna is due to its position on the Z bracket, this gets hit with a lot of foliage when branches go past the car. But since it's just a flexible copper wire in a um, plastic nylon sleeve, you can bend this all around the place and it has absolutely no problem with that and just returns to straight. So this will cope with being smashed with whatever, um, whatever foliage you can find to bang it on. 
and it will handle that a hell of a lot better than the fiberglass broomsticks you see on some people's cars, which although they look really tough and heavy, they've actually got quite fine wires going up the fiberglass. Um, repeated impacts will break those wires and eventually they'll just stop working. These antennas are made of um, spring steel, so again, impacts aren't a problem. This one a little less so, you can see it's slightly bent, but it generally um, bends back. Around the back here, we have the Kodan 9350. So while this isn't an optimal position to mount it due to its proximity to the steel belted radials and the spare tire, and the body of the car when this is closed, it is somewhere we can find to mount it. It's a little hard to mount. It was originally designed to be mounted on the bull bar, but then Australian design rules clarified that actually they didn't like that sort of thing going on and now there's a 25 millimeter thickness limit for any antenna you put on the bull bar. So that's out and so it has to be mounted on the back of the vehicle. It has a 2.2 meter whip on the top of it, which the top of this sits at two meters, making the top of that whip 4.2 meters, which is on the legal limit for the tallest a light vehicle is allowed to be. Whether antennas count for that, I'm not actually sure. That one's a stainless steel whip, but there's actually two other antennas that Kodan has. The key advantage of this antenna is that in here, there is a big coil. There is a plunger that runs up and down the coil on a motor. And what that allows it to do is it can adjust that coil to be right on any HF frequency from 1.8 to 30 megahertz. So this, um, this will do any frequency in that range, whereas you saw that the other HF antenna at the front can only do 10 megahertz. So the disadvantage of that is that it's got a much lower power rating than the other one. If you want to do voice, you can do 100 watts, but data being a continuous signal is limited to only 25 watts. In addition to that, it's a little less efficient because the coil is at the base of the antenna, not halfway up. Now we have two more antennas, this being an A-series 9350, the early one. It has a fiberglass broomstick. Now with the 2.2 meter antenna on there, this won't quite tune the higher end of the HF band. So when, once you get above about 20 megahertz, that's a, bit, that's a bit long for this to be happy. So this one is better at that end. This one is no longer included with the newer Dance. Instead, they have something like that, but shorter, because again, the wire in the middle broke after too many impacts with trees, and the harsh UV sun in Australia eventually just wrecks the black fiberglass on the edge of it, and they just fall to bits. This one is the Kodan emergency whip. So this is designed to be stored as a spare to that antenna for much reduced space. The only thing is this won't go below seven megahertz and will have greatly reduced efficiency at most frequencies, as it's a lot shorter. Um, since it has a nut, instead of having the screw permanently fitted to it, you can also screw it directly on in a real emergency if you've lost the spring. Mm. But I wouldn't do that while the car's in motion because if you bend that back and forward too much in this spot here, you will snap it there. So lastly, this one mounted above the spare tire is an RFI CD7194. This is not an antenna for two-way radio like the others. This is a mobile phone antenna. This is just mounted above the number plate on this side. But where it connects to is there is a Microtik um, router board RBM11G in there with a Sierra Wireless MC7430 mini PCIe 4G modem in it. Why that very specific modem? It's one of the few mini PCIe modems that's well supported that uh, supports band 28, which is 4G over 700 megahertz, which is critically important because Telstra basically has all of their regional coverage on that band. If your modem doesn't support that, you're basically not going to get much signal at all outside the city. In addition to the antenna on the back, there is also a stick-on antenna on the inside connected to the second antenna port. This just provides a little bit of diversity reception for increased speeds in the city where uh, signal is good. Uh, as for the radio gear, the 
ICOM 7100 is mounted here on the bracket. That's the actual radio body. You'll see it has two antenna outputs there. One of them for UHF VHF, which goes to the bull bar antenna, and one of them for HF, which connects to the Kodan 9350. There's also a little homemade adapter down there which converts the signals that the ICOM expects out of an automatic antenna tuner to the kind of signals the Kodan produces in order to interface this Kodan antenna with the ICOM radio. The protocol involved is dead simple, so it's actually quite a simple device, just an Arduino Nano and some passive components, and it works really well. In the back here is the Kodan 9323. This has a much bigger base unit because unlike the 7100, which is like a 2010s design, this was brought out in 1993. So not even all of the boards in it are surface mount. There is also a GPS receiver that is very much duct taped to the top of this on a metal plate for a better ground plane. It's duct taped down because no matter what kind of double-sided tape I put on it, it would not stay put. I need to figure out a better way of mounting that. In behind the Kodan, in the little, um, in the little cubby hole for the third row passengers, there is a Raspberry Pi 4 and a Digi rig. What the Raspberry Pi 4 does is generate the signals for APRS to be fed into the Kodan for transmission. And the DigiRig is an all-in-one USB serial, PTT control, and audio interface, all in one device with one USB cable. This is really handy in a, in a thing like this because it's also plugged into the GPS, it's also plugged into the ICOM, and there's also an RTL-SDR on the IF tap of the 7100 which at some point will be used to power a nice radio waterfall display. In addition to that it's also connected to another RTL SDR that can be connected to one of the front antennas for um, radio sound finding. Yesterday we showed you about the electrical system here but there's some fun stuff hidden down the front. So in addition to that 4G modem there is a microtik which is what actually provides the Wi-Fi from the modem. Now, why do I do two separate devices when one would suffice? Well, the RBM 11G only has one mini PCIe slot, which is taken up with the modem, so there's no Wi-Fi slot in it. It's not actually running router OS, it's running a distro called Router, which is a fork of OpenWRT, which provides drivers for many additional modems. Router OS's modem support is pretty terrible. It doesn't even support MBIM, for instance, until Router OS v7, which I think is rivaling Duke Nukem forever for... Um, router OS 7 is out. It's finally out. It's finally out now and I probably should try it, but the system works so I'm not going to change it. So the secret to the magic here is this little box here. And what this little box has in it is two relays that uh, only provide power to both devices when they want it. So how it works is the Raspberry Pi has some hardware attached to it which tells it whether the car is currently powered on or not. And when the car is turned off, um, it waits five minutes and then safely shuts down the Pi. And when the Pi is fully shut down, then it cuts the power to itself. This means it doesn't have a standby drain on the battery at all when the car is not running. The uh, 4G modem. The Microtik has a similar relay on its USB port. The relay is switched on when the Microtik's USB power is on, and this keeps power supplied to it after the car has been turned off. Half an hour after the last client disconnects from the Wi-Fi, the Microtik will turn off its USB port power, which will untrigger that relay, which will cut power to, the, to it and the 4G modem. And so it's not on all the time when no one's around the car. But if you are still around the car connected to the Wi-Fi, it keeps the modem turned on. But this is a fairly big and annoying box to deal with. So at some point I'm going to manufacture a PCB that does this. I'll tell you when I've got that made and you can go and buy one. So here we are back under the bonnet again. Now in a modern vehicle where you've got a lot of electronics in the vehicle, you need to do something about all of the electrical noise it generates if you want to be able to use HF radio in the vehicle while the engine's on. So what we've done here is engine components which generate noise have been ferrited. 
Unfortunately, not enough slack in the cable to get two turns through the ferrite, but one turn still does provide a noticeable reduction in noise. So wiring to the control unit here has been ferrited. Under here, the injectors have been ferrited. You need to be careful doing that to unipolar injectors. Otherwise, the added inductance may affect their timing and result in more or less diesel ending up in the engine. But these are bipolar injectors and they seem fine after we've done it. In addition to that, there is a bunch of ground bonding being done here. So we've got grounding straps on the bonnet on both sides. At the back here, there is a grounding strap on the boot lid and on this side as well, along with some plastic paint protector, stop that from getting damaged. And under here, there are also straps on the tailgate. Under the vehicle, you will also see that we have some grounding straps between the rear bar and the body. Since this is cab on frame, you need to ground the body of the vehicle to the chassis and also the exhaust pipe has been grounded at this end to the chassis. Why is that really important? Well, the exhaust pipe as it goes down the vehicle for vibration and noise reasons is mounted on these rubber stops. And this effectively means it's electrically insulated from the entire vehicle. If you don't connect it back to the vehicle at this end, it's effectively a big long insulated wire heading from there to here, which we would generally refer to as an antenna. If you want more information on doing that, as well as some testing showing exactly how much of a difference it made, I did a separate video on that, which you can find the link down in the description. Um, the only thing I need to point out about that video is we actually had the preamp turned on on the radio, which made all the S unit measurements like two S units higher than they otherwise would have been. Subtract two from all of those measurements um, as you watch it. Join us next time for a look at the rear fit out. All the supporting equipment and tools in the back. Subscribe so you don't miss it, and see you then.